assalamu alaikum students so today's lecture in we'll uh, discuss the functional anatomy of the kidney and nephron uh, the function uh, the detailed anatomy of kidney will be covered in your anatomy classes uh, so basically our main focus will be to describe uh, more anatomy for the nephron than cross features of the kidney okay so the learning objectives are uh, again the physiological anatomy of uh, some, some features of the kidney gross features while uh, some details of the nephron and special emphasis will be given to the ultra microscopic features uh, of the structure of the nephron especially the glomerulus and how the function uh, the filtration barrier uh, is formed and so on and so forth uh, then we will we'll also talk about the unique features of glomerular membrane as a as opposed to the other capillaries uh, of the body and we'll wrap things up uh, by talking about overall functions of the nephron at the end of this lecture uh, before we do that uh, let me just recap the functions of kidney we all know this uh, basically uh, mainly is the filtration of blood uh, kidney has a very high blood flow and it, it's uh, the reason for this high blood flow is so that it filters it filters out uh, all the metabolic waste products and other chemicals. Uh, I would like you to have this concept about the kidney as the master organ, uh, the old man sitting in the corner, the wise, the wise one. So while we have uh, other mechanisms going on uh, for osmolality, uh, arterial blood pressure, and acid-base balance, uh, but if we want to really bring things back to dot, so there's a disturbance in say uh, arterial blood pressure as you uh, have studied in circulation during your first year, uh, there are fluctuate, there can be fluctuations in arterial blood pressure and there are so many mechanisms uh, geared towards bringing it back uh, to normal. The baroreceptor reflex is an acute mechanism, then there are uh, fluid shift mechanisms and so on but which is that one uh, mechanism which brings it right back to its mathematical normal dot that's the kidney same goes for uh, acid base balances uh, you have buffers you have mechanisms to cater to changes in ph in the body uh, to resist change in ph it's very important but the, it's the kidney which brings the whole thing down back to normal when it uh, 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 when the chips are down for acid and base balance. Okay, so really, it's it's the long term mechanisms, the robust, stable changes that kidney uh, brings about in the body, and that's why uh, one of the most uh, detailed descriptions in homeostasis is that of this particular organ. Okay. Now, as I mentioned that we won't be dwelling too much on the gross features. Uh, so this is really it, this slide and the rest, it will be dealt by uh, anatomy department. So there are two kidneys uh, on the posterior wall of the abdomen. Uh, it's uh, protected by a tight capsule. Uh, so on the outside of the kidney, is, is basically a glistening tight capsule. Uh, it's tight, so anything which is, uh, if things start to expand within uh, the kidney uh, tissue, uh, untoward, abnormal, uh, this capsule uh, would resist the expansion of the kidney and hence uh, it is supplied also by pain fibers. So anything which expands, so for example, is a renal stone, or any growth inside the kidney. It can be, it is excruciatingly painful. Uh, the same goes for ureter. People who have experienced a kidney stone uh, would know that kidney pain is one of those pains which is really, really disturbing because what is happening is the tight capsule is, uh, it does not allow the kidney to expand much and hence, and it's rich, richly supplied by pain sensing fibers so anything expanding would immediately be 
uh, uh, sends alarms to the CNS as pain. Uh, also known, uh, a ureter is known for a very painful uh, situation. If a kidney stone were to come out of the kidney and get uh, into the ureter. Right. So having said that, so one is capsule. Uh, this area, this you can see that it's kidney shaped, uh, kidney bean shaped. Okay. And this whole area here is called the hilum through which the ureter comes out, the blood vessels go in and so forth. Uh, the outer portion, very important portion is called the cortex, while the inner, even more important portion is called the medulla, where you see the, these pyramid like structures going on. And these pyramid uh, seem to be uh, connected or they come uh, in series with uh, these apices of the renal pelvis. This is where the, the newly formed urine, these, this is where your nephrons are. So these nephrons, through their collecting duct, they dump the newly formed urine into this renal pelvis, which then goes down the ureter, which is the main function of the kidney, right? Okay, then he has uh, uh, given you this uh, expanded view of this area, for example, uh, right here. But first, let's just quickly see uh, how are the vessels arranged. So you see the renal artery going into the kidney and forming a very intricate structure around the pyramids, which basically, if later on we'll see that it's basically the subsequent branching of this renal artery that eventually forms the arcuate artery. And the arcuate artery, right at the, at the base of the pyramid, then forms the afferent arteriole, which if you remember, afferent arteriole uh, goes on and becomes a tuft of capillaries called the glomerulus, which then drains into another arteriole, not a vein, arteriole, which is called the efferent arteriole. Okay. And the efferent arteriole eventually uh, then becomes the uh, tributaries of the veins and renal vein is formed and it exits the kidney. So this is uh, just about the, uh, the gross features that I'll be, I'll be touching about. Uh, this, uh, however, is an interesting diagram. If you notice, uh, the cortex is shown and then outer medulla is shown and then inner medulla is shown. So if I were to explain it out here, we are going from cortex deep into the kidney tissue. Okay. Right. So, and, and the numbers here are basically blood flow uh, in, in milliliters per minute per gram tissue. So you see that uh, as you go deeper into the, into the tissue of the kidney from cortex to innermost medulla, the blood flow seem to decrease. So you have a cortex in which there is four to five ml per minute per, 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 per unit tissue of the kidney. And as you go inside uh, into the outer medulla, you, it, it drops to 0.7 to one. And then very interestingly, in the inner medulla, it even drops further, 0.2 to 0.25. This has uh, uh, physiological and clinical implications. So the innermost medulla, the deepest part of the kidney is uh, by, by design uh, structured in a way that it gets very sluggish, very, very less blood flow as compared to the rest of the kidney. Uh, this also, this obviously has a lot of structural importance. And if I just say the key word here, it is involved in form formation of the ability of the kidney to form concentrated urine. If, if this region needs to have sluggish blood flow because it involves the nephrons, which are involved in concentration of urine. Okay, we'll, we'll obviously uh, go into details later on. And at the same time, this same fact of less blood flow in the inner medulla makes it vulnerable to ischemic injury. So uh, both the, the design, which gives us uh, a, a brilliant ability to conserve water, at the same time makes the inner medulla vulnerable to ischemic injury, okay? So that's, that's one thing, very important thing to note. Then you have the mundane uh, information, which I'm sure you have studied uh, all uh, through your FSC and your A-levels. Uh, 
about 1 million nephrons in both kidneys. Um, and the types are basically two types. So there is one smaller or shorter uh, nephron called the cortical nephron. And you can see that it's placed in the cortex while the, the short loop of Henle just loops back in the outer medulla. It has got nothing to do with the inner medulla. So these, these, are, these are cortical nephrons and they form the majority of nephrons. 85% of nephrons are cortical nephrons. Then you see the other type of nephrons. And here you can immediately see the difference. This is a much bigger nephron. This, this is the juxta medullary neuron. Juxta is next, next to the uh, nephron. Juxta medullary nephron. And what is the difference between this nephron and this? Is that the loop of Henle is long and it really loops deep into the inner medulla and comes back and so on. It is this loop of Henle in juxta medullary nephrons which is involved in concentration of urine, as mentioned earlier. So that's that. Uh, these diagrams I've, 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 I have mentioned here to show you, I mean, this is just a bare bone diagram of the nephrons. It does not show you the blood vessels. And you can, you can appreciate uh, right here is the afferent arteriole, okay? And afferent arteriole is going in, making this uh, ball-like structure, which obviously at this magnification, you can only appreciate that it's, a, it's, a, it's like a ball-like structure. This is the glomerulus, right? And then glomerulus uh, comes uh, continuous with efferent arteriole. And it's the efferent arteriole which in this diagram just stops in midway, okay? But that's not the case. And if you can just follow that efferent arteriole here, efferent arteriole then goes on to form this very articulate, intricate uh, blood vascular structure uh, uh, that combs or, or makes like a, a, like a spider web around the loop of Henle. Uh, the, the rest of the tubule, proximal tubule, distal tubule, and the loop of Henry. Okay, this is called the peritubular network, and for obvious reasons, it is uh, there for to provide nutrition to the cells of the tubule, but also is involved in the uh, secretion and reabsorption uh, function of the kidney, which is extremely important. And the difference between a cortical nephron peritubular structure and uh, juxta medullary uh, peritubular structure is quite obvious. Uh, it just uh, follows the tubule. So here it has to follow the tubule all the way through the long loop of Henle, which dips down deep into the medulla. And, and that's why we have a special name for it. Uh, the, the, the peritubular network around the loop of Henle in juxta, in juxta medullary nephrons is called the vasa recta. The vasa recta basically are blood vessels which surround the long loop of Henle in juxta medullary nephrons. And as uh, I mentioned earlier, the function of juxta medullary nephrons is to concentrate urine, and hence the vasa recta play a very key role in concentration of urine. More details when we uh, go to this subject, inshallah. Uh, very quickly, the blood and nerve supply. I mentioned that renal artery eventually, after a lot of branches, makes the arcuate arteries, which then eventually make the afferent arterioles. Afferent arterioles make the glomerulus, which then drains into the efferent arteriole. Efferent arteriole then goes on to make the peritubular network and in the dextromedullary nephrons, the vasa recta. Uh, an important point to note is uh, although the kidney is very self-sufficient in regulation of its own blood flow, and we, you men we mentioned this in, again, in circulation, special circulation, uh, the phenomena called autoregulation. So kidney is very famous for its autoregulation mechanisms. Still, it does have its, uh, its uh, share of sympathetic nerve fibers. And these sympathetic nerve fibers are, are known to vasoconstrict the renal vessels and stimulate it and also can increase the sodium uh, reabsorption uh, from uh, proximal tubule cells and also affect renin secretion. Renin is a hormone, we'll talk about it. 
from the dextromedullary apparatus. Okay. Right. So we move on. Uh, now we go to the specifics. The gloss uh, features uh, have finished as far as this lecture is concerned. Now we uh, go on to define the nephron and its ultrastructure. Just for revision, these are the two uh, types of nephron, the, the more abundant cortical nephron uh, and the very Im functionally important dextromedullary nephron. So uh, again, an anatomical classification is uh, renal of the nephron is renal corpuscle and long tubule. So as far as these terms are concerned, this whole thing here, this whole thing, this is called the renal corpuscle, which then becomes continuous with the long tubule of the nephron. Goes all the way, collecting duct, and goes into the papilla, and then becomes continuous with the renal pelvis and the ureter, and so on. So renal corpuscle basically uh, includes glomerulus, as I mentioned right here, okay. Uh, mesangium, which is uh, the spaces uh, within the tuft of the capillaries of the glomerulus, it's occupied by cells, and the Bauman caps at the space. So this is Bauman capsule, this right here, in which uh, it is comes in close proximity to the glomerulus, and there is of course a space between glomerulus and the Bauman space. Uh, it can't be shown here; it will be shown later. It's called the Bauman space. Okay, so this whole thing is referred to as a renal corpuscle. Okay, and then you have the long tubule. So these two things basically make your nephron. Now, this is important in the sense that it comes in your uh, uh, university question as a university question. How is glomerulus different from the other capillaries? So we'll, we'll talk about that. But first, let's just uh, look at the structure. Uh, this is the approximate diameter, 200 mi uh, micrometers. It's an invagination of capillaries within the uh, Bauman capsule. Uh, it's, uh, it's the two ends are afferent arteriole and efferent arteriole, as we've mentioned. Now, there are two types of cells, uh, 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 the structure of which we'll shortly be looking at. One is the podocytes, and, one, and the other is uh, mesangial cells. Now, the important anatomical difference is that podocyte is uh, is uh, outside the basal lamina of the glomerular capillaries, okay? While the mesangial cells is uh, within uh, the basal lamina and the endothelium of the, of the uh, glomerular capillaries. So mesangial cells is part of the wall of the glomerular capillaries, while podocyte is outside, so stuffed in the tufts of glomerular, uh, the whole glomerulus. While mesangial cell is part of the wall, this is this has important uh, uh, structural and functional uh, consequences. We'll talk about podocyte, then eventually becoming part of the filtration uh, barrier, the membrane itself. While mesangial cells, being part of the capillary, uh, provide support, structural support, nutritional support to the cells, uh, and also have been shown to uh, have acted in myosin filament. So contraction of the mesangial cells as a consequence for uh, the overall uh, surface area of the glomerulus. Okay, uh, so the membrane, the glomerular membrane uh, permits free passage for neutral, by neutral we mean uh, electric, electrically neutral substances uh, for up to four nanometers. Uh, you, would, you, would, you would maybe think about why we, we stressed about the uh, neutral uh, electrical status of these molecules. So uh, I'm sure you have read somewhere that the basal lamina, the basement membrane that is, is full of proteins. It's made up of proteins. It's a thick layer in tissues and it's negatively charged. So th this is the glomerulus is no exception. It's also negatively charged in the glomerulus. So if you can imagine if something were to filter through the glomerular membrane, uh, and if it's negatively charged, like a plasma protein, uh, not only will the big structure of the plasma protein be a, be a hindrance to its passage, but also the negative charge on it, on the plasma protein, 
will be repelled by the negative charge of the basement membrane. Okay, so these are important differences to note. So neutral substances of four nanometer diameter uh, size is uh, are are most welcome to go through the glomerular membrane. It would normally should exclude more than eight nanometer diameter molecules. And examples of freely permeable stuff is water, small solutes like sodium, urea, glucose, etc. Now this is uh, where the the university question hides. Okay, how is this glomerular capillary bed unique? So number one point is the way the glomerulus is structured between the two arterioles. The net capillary pressure, the hydrostatic pressure within the glomerulus is higher, is quite high actually, as you can see. It's 55 to 60 millimeter mercury. It's much higher than your average uh, hydrostatic pressure across any other capillary membrane, okay, which is around 35 to 40. So this is a high pressure bed, okay. This is very important. Why is it important? Because one of the main functions where the whole story starts in the nephron is filtration. And in kidney, it's not simple filtration. Filtration happens across all the capillary beds. So nothing, nothing fantastic there. But what is distinguished in capillary of, of the glomerulus is that it has the uh, cap capability of ultrafiltration. Ultrafiltration, we'll talk about that. So ultrafiltration requires a higher hydrostatic pressure than your average capillary bed. So this is a very important point to note. Secondly, it's filtration only. So uh, it's, it's basically between two arterioles, if you have noticed. It doesn't have a venous end, quote unquote. Both are afferent and efferent, both are, both are arterioles. Uh, and therefore, it is filtration only. There is no reabsorption going on across the capillaries. It's made for filtration because the main function of the kidney is filtration. So this again is a very important feature. Uh, then the permeability, it is 100 times more because the pressure is more, the structure of the uh, uh, whole thing is, is, is such that under high pressure, lots of stuff goes through, is supposed to go through the glomerular membrane into the Bauman space and onto the uh, long tubule uh, uh, to be acted upon by the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle and so on. So the permeability uh, factor here is, is much more than your other capillary beds of the body. Uh, and then you have the last point is that it has a double membrane system for ultrafiltration. Remember this word ultrafiltration. It has the capability of ultrafiltration because it provides a double membrane system while the ordinary capillary networks have a single membrane. If you remember, it's just the endothelium of the capillaries, which is the membrane of the capillary system. Here you have the, end, you have the endothelium and you have that photocyte cell, which uh, uh, forms uh, the second membrane outside the endothelium. We'll look at it. So these should be five. There are four here. Fifth is the fact that it has afferent and efferent arterioles at both ends and no venous drainage. So they, these should be five uh, unique points which make the capillary bed. And remember, uh, this can be asked in a viva or an SEQ. Okay, now, so we are now looking at the, at the glomerulus. This is actually a micrograph of how it looks like. So look at how a uh, small ball-like tuft-like scenario uh, uh, picture that it has. Okay, so this is the glomerulus in actual. This is obviously a very uh, magnified view of the, of the, of the photograph. And here, is the cut edge of the nephron. So uh, obviously it's not a 3D diagram and the glomerulus, this being the Bauman space and the Bauman capsule must be around somewhere. It would be uh, uh, continuous with this tube here, which had to be cut and put aside to show you the glomerulus. So you see the cut portion of the, of the, of the uh, uh, tubule while you see the whole 3D diagram of the glomerulus. This is what it looks like. And when you slit it like that in the frontal plane, just cut it, slice it out. 
this is the schematic that you get. Okay, so this is how the glomerulus actually looks like. You uh, vertically sliced it through and through, and what you saw is this. So you see the cut portion of the glomerular tuft right here, okay? Contained within the capsule. This is the Bauman space. And then this space becomes continuous with the tubule called, this portion of the tubule is called the proximal tubule, okay? Uh, you can see that afferent arteriole is coming in like this. It then forms this tuft, then gets drained into the efferent arteriole, and that's that. I will I will come to this point uh, at, uh, at the last. If you notice, there are two types of uh, color within the glomerular tuft. One is this green stuff. You can notice it's re really abutting the. Uh, glomerular capillaries, uh, and then you have this golden yellowish big cell being depicted here and then here, okay? Now, basically, this cell here is the mesangial cell, and you can see that it abuts, it really is uh, very, very close to the uh, capillary. It, indeed, it's part of the structure of the capillary that I just mentioned. Then the green stuff, you, you, if you can appreciate, uh, you can actually see the nucleus of the cell and look at the, 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 the cell body of the cell, okay? Right here, then you have another one here, then you have another one here. And this is, uh, let me just show you this, concentrate on this one. It's a big cell with its nucleus and look look what it's doing. It's, it's surrounding, it's surrounding the whole glomerulus. It's like it, it, it's dominating the whole thing here. And it, it's giving off these, uh, these uh, projections all around uh, uh, the, the, the glomerulus. And protocyte is that cell. So it basically has uh, a cell body and nucleus residing somewhere, uh, but its, it's uh, projections are far reaching. And as far as uh, it can possibly go and it the the it's it's like an octopus so the octopus has a body and then the projections of the its tentacles that go that's a good example actually so it's like an octopus which sits here but its uh, tentacles are all over the place so they literally surround the glomerulus uh, in a in a tubular fashion uh, and we'll talk about uh, how important this is this is actually the second membrane uh, that forms around the uh, glomerulus. Uh, once we see the ultra high magnification of this area, you'll, you'll uh, complete your concept about the photocyte as the second membrane. So finally, we talk about what's happening here. So remember the cut, remember the tubule, which is uh, formed uh, in continuation of the Bauman space. Well, when it goes, when it becomes the proximal tubule, it then goes on to become the uh, loop of Henle eventually. And as you know, the loop of Henle, let me just go back to show you. Yeah, this is it. So this is where we are right now in ultra magnification. This is the Bauman capsule, which is in, in continuation with this loop, which is proximal tubule, which then becomes the loop of Henle. And then look closely what happens. It loops back, becomes the distal convoluted tubule here. And then very interestingly, the distal convoluted tubule uh, sort of loops and becomes very close to the glomerulus and then whisks away. It's this area, right, where my cursor is. It's this area which is extremely important physiologically speaking. We'll, we'll talk about that. But if you cut it like this in the frontal section, this tube here will look like a roundish structure, right? Because it's a frontal cut. This is what you see. So this is that distal commentary tubule coming in close touch with the glomerulus and then it would loop away 
and form the collecting duct, right? I hope you got that. Now, look closely. When this cut distal tubule, the cells of it facing the afferent arteriole, some interesting stuff comes uh, becomes apparent. So the, if you can look close, I don't know if uh, you can appreciate this. Uh, you can always uh, open a, uh, any book, open up Guyton and look at the diagram. Probably it's from Guyton. Uh, generally, the cells are cuboidal, low cuboidal cells, okay, of this distal tubule. But the cells that are facing the afferent arterioles are tall columna. I hope you notice it. And while it stains darkly anyway, but the tall columnar cells are specially dark. They're very darkly stained. And they indeed, the ones that face the afferent arteriole, they form a disc. And when you look, if you are sitting inside the lumen of the distal tubule and you're looking around in a 3D form, if you look at the, uh, the, the other cells, the, the cuboidal cells, you, you won't find any, any, any especially dark coloration. However, as soon as you put your eyes on the cells which are facing the afferent arterioles, uh, these darkly stained, very darkly stained cells, uh, you would indeed uh, see a disc almost disc-like structure because of the very dark stain that uh, these cells take up. And that's why they are called macula densa. Densa means dark, macula means a disc. So basically it's not a physical disc, but it's just the cells that are facing the afferent arteriole and they appear like a disc under the microscope. And they uh, 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 stain very darkly. We call, it, we call them macula densa. Now, this is uh, what the tubule uh, looks like and the opposing afferent arteriole, remember? And now the afferent arteriole, as any arteriole, is made up of endothelial cells, basement membrane, and then uh, the smooth muscles that surround the arteriole. Now, very interestingly, the smooth muscles that, are, that come across the macula densa, they change and here they are labeled as blue to show you uh, the difference from the average routine smooth cells. So these are those smooth cells which are not part of uh, anything close to the macula densa. However, these cells which come across the macula densa, they stain differently and they are different. Okay, their function is different. Their function is not primarily contraction, which is the function of the smooth muscle of the arteriole. These cells have a name. They are called JG cells juxta glomerular next to glomerulus juxta glomerular cells so juxta glomerular cells of the afferent arteriole are placed opposite the macular densa of the distal tubule right of the nephron together these jg cells and macular densa they form the juxta glomerular apparatus Extraglomerular apparatus. Okay, and very briefly, a signal from the tubule is sensed by macula densa, which then triggers a response in the closely lying JG cells. And then JG cells respond by releasing a hormone, which I mentioned earlier, renin. A hormone called renin, which then gets secreted inside the blood coming into the afferent arteriole. So signal sensed by macula densa, macula densa then stimulating or giving that signal to JG cells. JG cells has preformed renin. It can form more renin. It has all the machinery for that. And then renin gets starts getting secreted more. There's a basal secretion rate. It increases when this signal emanates from the distal convoluted tubule, okay? This structure is very important, the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and, and its renin secretion forms one of the main stages of the long-term uh, regulation of blood pressure. Uh, we'll complete this picture as we go along this lecture series. Not this particular lecture, but lectures later on. Okay, so this is that, this is the ultra microscopic structure of the whole system. Uh, I want you to look at this first. 
see how the cut capillaries of the cross-sectional glomerulus appear as just cut up tubes, right? I hope you get the orientation. It's just a, uh, a magnification of any part of this area here, okay? And you can now appreciate in, in proper detail the mesangial cell being part of the basement membrane inside, literally inside the wall of the capillary. So this is a, a rather uh, medium-sized cell within the, within the uh, basement membrane of the capillary. So if this changes its, contra its, uh, its size by contraction or expansion, it will naturally have an effect on the capillary. One of the postulated uh, functions of the cell uh, and support being one of the obvious uh, functions of the cell, okay? Now, look at Mr. Octopus here. Look at the cell. This is the photocyte. So this is the cell body, the nucleus, and it's a busy bee, as you can see. It has its, its, uh, its uh, agents, its processes, all around wherever it can get its tentacles on, okay? So it really extends its processes to far off areas and surround them like this. So this is that projection of the podocyte. Now we are magnifying this bit, okay, this bit this bit here, how the process of the podocyte, when it comes near the capillary, the glomerular capillary, what does it do? You see that it then divides into many, many finger-like projections. These finger-like projections are called foot processes, foot processes. Uh, and these foot processes, they wrap around. Now, if I were in physical in front of you, I would wrap around my fingers around the tube or a pencil. And the, and the fingers would be the foot processes. And the, the space between the fingers would be the filtration slits, as we'll see just in a bit. But let, let's, stay with, let's stay with this diagram first. So this is the foot process. Uh, this is, I beg your pardon, the projection of the photocyte, one of several that it does. And here it features when it approaches a glomerular capillary, it then divides into many, many finger-like projections, which wrap around the glomerulus, glomerular capillary segment where it's close to and makes a a, 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 this whole wrapping of these finger-like projections uh, make a situation where between the finger-like projections, the foot processes, uh, there are slits through which stuff can come out. So the plot thickens. Now, this portion we have mag further magnified here. So now you can see the proper structure of the filtration membrane as it's called. So from within the glomerulus, this is within the glomerulus, you see the endothelial cells cut up and there are spaces between the endothelial cells, which in this case are quite broad. This is another microscopic feature which is distinguished uh, from the other capillary networks. In the other capillary networks, the inter-endothelial cell uh, space is not this big, but since it's 100 times more permeable, you see that uh, the space is quite big by capillary standards. It's actually called fenestrate, fenestrations, uh, the plural of it. This is that basement membrane, the basement lamina, big lamina, negatively charged, repelling the negatively charged big ions, uh, uh, molecules, okay? And then now here you see the, the cross-section foot processes that got cut up because we opened it up for you. Okay, and these are the, the, uh, the finger-like projections with, which wrap around the glomerulus. Okay, so very, very clear here. Uh, and within, in between the foot processes, you, you see a space. This is the filtration slit. This is the filtration slit. So if you were a molecule, you would have to negotiate three things. If you were a molecule, 
inside the glomerulus and you came along on a journey on an adventure inside the inside the blood from the afferent arterial and now you want to see what's going on inside the tubule of the kidney sorry what would what would you do you will have to go through the fenestration you will have to deal with the basement membrane then you have to find your way not colliding into the food process but rather finding a way in between the food processes through the filtration slit and on to the bowman space then the bowman capsule and then the tubule and your journey then uh, takes you to the proximal convoluted tubule and so on here a point of uh, uh, a point of importance is that fenestration has a diameter of 70 to 90 however the filtration slit has a diameter of 25 nanometers dwell on this for a bit see what what the math tells you so the fenestration are quite permeable this is what gives the whole thing a lot of permeability however it's not very selective because look at the size so where does the remember our optimal size is a neutrally charged four nanometer particle it's nowhere near this right but look at the filtration slits then it's the filtration slits which uh, bestow the the selectivity of filtration so through this system while this is more porous it's this here is is not very porous so something which has to go across the filtration membrane that it, that will have to negotiate with the combined selectivity of the narrow uh, diameter which is given by the filtration slits anyway so this is uh, what you need to know about the ultra structure of the uh, uh, of the filtration glomerular filtration barrier and if you want to really complete the picture here uh, look at this so you have the uh, capillary the endothelium the basement membrane the cut portions of the food processes of the photocyte and check this out the filtration slit actually has a slit diaphragm so if you really want to complete this whole picture in detail even the filtration slit has a diaphragm the slit diaphragm and there is a hole in between uh, inside the uh, slit diaphragm and it's actually it's not the whole passage which is available for you to go through it's the that hole in the slit diaphragm that the particle needs to go through okay so this is that complete thing if uh, unfortunately you have to make this diagram i say unfortunately because it's not anatomy course it's it's, it's physiology so stuff should be asked uh, which is conceptual and so on but however sometimes uh, the, the the examiner is interested to 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 know uh, how do you conceptualize uh, this uh, very important filtration barrier and for that he or she may ask you to draw i think this is a very good diagram to draw okay so make a note of this the the other diagrams are just too detailed and uh, there is limited time in your profession exams so i think this is a nice uh, schematic diagram which can be drawn quickly and remember to label it if when if asked this is an actual micrograph of the stuff look at look at this this is guess what it is this is the photocyte this big cell body and then the processes of the photocyte going everywhere look look at look look at this look at how octopus like it is sending off its uh, its tentacles its uh, what you call the processes and then them wrapping around this whole glomerulus that it, uh, glomerular duct okay this is from glomerulus from the outside and this is a glomerulus from the inside so you're looking from the capillary wall of the capillary you're sitting inside the capillary and see this mesh this beautiful mesh you can see the white cells white blood cells uh, some platelets as well and look at this honeycomb kind of appearance these are fenestrations from within so i hope this completes your uh, imagination imaginary uh, picture of the of the glomerular membrane uh, we move on to pure more pure physiology now uh, 
So this is a schematic uh, diagram of the of the nephron. Usually, it's uh, this this diagram is drawn horizontally in books. So don't be worried about that. It's really the same. I like this vertical depiction of the of the of the nephron. Okay. So now it should be clear that afferent arterial comes in, makes the glomerulus, and then drains into the efferent, and the efferent goes on to make the peritubular capillary network. While the while the glomerulus it sits inside the uh, Bauman space, then the Bauman capsule, and the Bauman capsule then becomes the uh, uh, the uh, nephron tubule, and so on and so forth. Now the the the, the thrust of the diagram of this diagram is basically to show you the four things that the, the kidney actually does, the nephron actually does. So the number one thing is filtration. Filtration happens across the glomerulus and the fluid that oozes out of the glomerulus is first caught in the Bauman space and then the Bauman capsule and then into the tubule, okay? And off it goes. Uh, two is reabsorption. So along the renal tubule, we haven't shown you the various uh, components of the renal tubule for simplicity, but along the tubule, uh, various reabsorptions take place. And the most reabsorption that takes place is in the proximal formulator tubule, which is right next to the Bauman capsule, the, the, i.e. the first stop uh, for the fluid that has come out freshly out of the glomerulus. So this reabsorption uh, basically means that stuff will now uh, go out of the tubule and will be captured by the peritubular network, which uh, uh, conveniently lies very closely with the tubule. So you can say that stuff that was given out is reclaimed by blood uh, from the tubule. This is a nice way of saying it. That's reabsorption. We don't call it absorption. We are calling it reabsorption. Very important. In GIT, we call it absorption because that is when it's picked up for the first time. It has now become part of blood. But when blood comes to the kidney and stuff goes out of it inside the tubule, now when you want to claim it, you have to use the word reclaim it, not just claim it. So we use the word reabsorption because it was part of the blood, got filtered out, and now the blood wants to reclaim it. Okay, I hope this reabsorption is clear. Secretion is when is the reverse of reabsorption, is when stuff which was not filtered in the glomerulus and it just tagged along the efferent arterial blood. But when it came close to the tubule, it thought, well, let me just join the tubular fluid. And it got secreted from the tubular capillaries, uh, peritubular capillaries inside the tubule and eventually out uh, into the urine. So stuff which is reabsorbed, filtered and reabsorbed does not come into the urine. I hope this point is obvious. And stuff which is not filtered, but rather it's secreted directly through the peritubular network goes into the urine, okay? And then fourth point is excretion itself. Excretion is when you have urine formation. So for, for something to be excreted, it's need to be, it needs to be filtered, not reabsorbed, and it can be secreted. So it eventually will find itself in the excretion. Uh, there are some small uh, uh, confusing to the uninformed mind MCQs that can be based on this equation. Very simple equation at the moment, but at exam time, this can be slightly confusing. So be very clear about this. For anything to end up in the urine, there are two ways to do it. Filter it, don't touch it, don't reabsorb it, and let it go. The other way is, if you don't want to filter it, secrete it, and then don't do anything with it. It will again find itself in the excretion. Uh, so filtrate, you, we know what the filtrate is. Filtrate is whatever has been uh, filtered out of the glomerulus. Uh, how is it formed? Uh, ultra, the ultra filtrate of the membrane and whatever happens uh, 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 across the glomerulus, whatever fraction of plasma, of blood, 
specifically plasma that gets filtered out of the glomerulus is called filtration fraction. And uh, so that you, you start memorizing this stuff, it's 20%. So if 100 units of plasma were to be given to the glomerulus, 20 units will become the filtrate. And 80 units will go on in the efferent arteriole and off you go. Okay, so filtration fraction is. We'll talk more about it. Don't be, don't, don't worry. But just so that you know that you've heard it before, filtration fraction is the part of plasma that is filtered out of the glomerulus when the blood comes in, and its mathematical value is 20% of the total blood, uh, specifically plasma, that entered the glomerulus. Where does it go? You know where does it go? What happens to it? It forms the urine. So these are the various uh, scenarios. Uh, substance one is filtration only. It got filtered, uh, nothing, nothing else to do. It just entered the urine and out it went. Then you have scenario number two, filtration and partial reabsorption. So it got filtered, came in the proximal tubule or wherever, and then partially was reabsorbed, but the rest of it was given out into the urine. Then you have another scenario, uh, this, by the way, can, you, you can say that it's uh, this is a typical waste product like uh, urea. Uh, this uh, an example can be given of uh, sodium or chloride. Uh, water can be given as an example. Okay, this here is filtration, complete reabsorption. So check this out. This is a special scenario. So you know the normal filtration happens, but this substance got filtered and then completely reabsorbed at the proximal cognitive tubule. Okay, so none of it goes beyond proximal cognitive tubule. And remember, this is most famously done by glucose. Glucose. It heavily filters out and it needs to be picked up entirely by the proximal cognitive tubule. In diabetics, this whole system is overwhelmed and hence you see glucose trickling down into the urine, which causes all sorts of issues, which we'll talk about. Then you see a substance which is uh, filtered and also uh, secreted, okay? Now, so this is basically the, the overall uh, creatinine. This is uh, uh, done by creatinine. It filters and gets secreted as well. Creatinine is a byproduct of protein metabolism. So this is an overall a further uh, uh, explanation of the function of the kidney. Okay, now uh, I'll be uh, explaining to you uh, some uh, clinical tidbits uh, along the way. So uh, since we've talked about the ureter and then the, which becomes the urethra uh, onwards, uh, this is an in interesting add-on to your knowledge and do keep your clinical knowledge taking along as you study physiology. Uh, it's, it's good so that when you actually study the subject of medicine, uh, you will immediately connect things with basic uh, physiological concepts to clinical ones. So UTIs are, are common in females and in males because they have a shorter uh, 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 urinary tract. Uh, the most common UTI is uh, caused by this uh, uh, organism called E. coli, Hysterichia coli. Uh, the symptoms are pain, burning feeling during uh, passing urine, and more frequency of urination. The analysis is urinalysis. You go, you send the patient the sample for a urine analysis, and you expect to find red and white cells in it, which normally should not be there. And then there are antibiotics for the treatment of UTI. So there you go. This is a, a UTI for you. And these are the references uh, which uh, I uh, referred to in making this lecture. So inshallah, see you in the next uh, lecture. Uh, take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.